Good afternoon, you guys. Thanks for joining us. We're really excited to continue the day of our symposium. And this event is, going to, is entitled Overcoming Challenges in Academic Medicine for Women. And we're delighted to have a, uh, you know, very prestigious and uh, a, a panel of women here who are leaders at Mount Sinai. I want to begin, though, by just acknowledging that the Office for Academic Development and Enrichment um, really is co-sponsoring this uh, panel with us in the Blavatnik Family Women's Health Research Institute because we're very interested in the careers of uh, junior faculty and all faculties. We think about mentorship and, and, and leadership, and you'll hear more about that, but this is one more of our many activities trying to address the needs of our faculty here at Mount Sinai. So I think some of you, most of you were with us this morning, um, but today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna ask a few questions of this panel, and then I'm gonna turn it over to you so that you can ask some questions that are burning for you in terms of uh, trying to understand how these women got to where they are at this institution, what kinds of challenges, uh, they have been through, and what kinds of lessons have they learned that they can share with the rest of us? So just to start off with, I'm going to ask, starting here with Dr. Hor Horowitz, to go down the panel and just start by each of them introducing themselves, what their role here is, how long they've been at Mount Sinai, and then maybe just one pearl that they'd like to start off with by uh, sharing with, with, with this uh, group of uh, uh, trainees and faculty. So hi, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm Carol Horowitz. I'm a general internist, and I do um, health equity and community-engaged research for most of my time. I am the new um, dean for gender equity and science and medicine here at Mount Sinai, which is a really big honor. Thank you. Um, and it's um, and it's only because I'm able to. Um, learn from all the amazing uh, people who have been doing this work here for a very long time. So it, it takes a family to do this work and there's a really wonderful family doing it here. Um, the, the Dean's Office is going to spend a lot of time looking at information and listening to people to understand where we are, um, how we heal from things that have gone wrong and how we do better in the future. Um, and we'll be inviting all of you to, to teach us and help us do better. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one, one pearl um, is um, something that somebody told me a long time ago, um, which is that they said women, but I think it's just people in general, um, have four balls. Have you ever heard this one? Um, and three are glass and one is rubber. Um, and the three glass balls are your family, your health, and your integrity. And if you drop any of those balls, they break. And the rubber one is your career. And if you drop that ball, it bounces. And it might bounce back in a different place than you thought it would. It might bounce back higher, but it's going to bounce. Um, and it reminded me, I don't think any of us have a perfectly easy path, but the bouncing always helps. Thank you. Wow, that's hard to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Lakshmi Devi. I am the, uh, I'm a professor of pharmacology neuroscience and psychiatry, but I'm also the Dean for Academic Development and Enrichment, an office that I actually share with Dr. Liz Howell. And the goal of this office is to provide support and resources for the career development of all faculty, including you. So the only way we can, um, our office can help you is if you could help us. So you have to reach out to us and if you can actually let us know your needs and um, your concerns, your, uh, your wants. We will try to accomplish some of your needs and trying to accommodate um, and address some of your concerns. Um, the pearl that I would like to share is actually what has helped me the most is to build a community and um, build a support system. And we will all survive. It's not just for women, of course, it's for everybody. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephanie Blank, and I'm a professor of uh, gynecologic oncology here. I'm the director of gynecologic oncology for the Mount Sinai Health System and the director of oncologic programs for the Lobotnik Family, <laughs> sorry, Women's Health Research Institute, um, and the director of women's health at uh, Chelsea downtown at the Lobotnik Family uh, 
Chelsea Medical Center at Mount Sinai <laughs> downtown. Anyway, um, I've been here just two years. I just hit my two-year birthday, and I've, I've really uh, enjoyed my time here. Um, in terms of a, a pearl, I'm just going to say just put your hand up, throw your name in. There's never a good time. Nobody's going to, just, don't just not do things because you think you won't get them. Just do things and uh, go for it. I'm Mary Ann McLaughlin, and I'm a cardiologist and uh, do clinical research. So I started out um, interested in public health and thought I was going to do it before medical school. And then during my cardiology fellowship, had the opportunity to do my master's in public health. And then I had the um, great opportunity to work with Dr. Carol Horowitz and Dr. Liz Howell in the department of then it was, well, now it's population health, um, to get my feet wet in, in research. But I still have a very large clinical practice, um, and we'll talk more about other things. My, my pearl is to remain optimistic um, and, and always just you, you know persevere, work hard, and things will happen, these chance opportunities. I think have come along to all of us. We heard Dr. Penn this morning talking about her chance opportunity with Dr. Healy, and then she becomes the director of the new institute. So those things have happened to all of us. So one, and it usually happens after some big failure or something goes wrong. And so just remember that to persevere and remain optimistic. That's my hint for today. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Lynn Richardson. I'm an emergency physician health services researcher here at Sinai. I'm system vice chair for emergency medicine. I'm professor of emergency medicine and of population uh, health science and policy. So I sometimes get to play with my good friends in uh, pop health uh, on various interesting projects. I've been at Mount Sinai a long time now, actually. 22 years. I'm almost afraid to say that. I feel like some of you are barely that old. Um, I've had a number of jobs while I was here, which is what has kept me here. As I every every time I start thinking about it's time to do something different, they give me another job and another opportunity, and so that has kept me here. Um, the advice that I always give to young faculty and trainees is to follow your passion. I think most of you already know that. I want to encourage you not to lose that. But I guess my pearl is that um, once you figure out that um, life is a script and you're the author and director, it kind of changes the way you look at everything. You know, we're all sort of born into scenarios. And at some point in our lives, some of us realize we don't have to live out that scenario that we were born into, that we are free to change the direction, uh, remake the character that we are. And once you start writing your own script, then it is so freeing. It also means you have total responsibility for what happens to you. But it also means that everything is possible for you. So learn to write your own script is my pearl. Great. Thank you all. So I'm going to start by just asking a question. Can you um, describe something that served as a turning point in your career progression from a junior faculty research position uh, that really, and how any advice that you can uh, pull from this experience? So again, something that served as a turning point for you. You know, we're talking about the different paths we can go on and, 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 and taking advantage of the moment. And we're wondering if any of you can share with us uh, your experience. Well, I can, um, I alluded to it a minute ago. Um, so after I have my master's in public health and I'm doing some research, um, et cetera, I was working with my, um, the chairman of the Department of Cardiology, Dr. Fuster, on a big, big grant that he had. And aside of that was a registry, which um, I was, this is a lot of to do. So I spent six months working on this big registry and translating all of the um, IRB materials into six different languages and getting all ready for it. And all of a sudden, it was pulled back. It was revoked. The, the, there was a lot of politics around having this registry. And um, the funding just became undone, like overnight. So Dr. Fusha was a little shocked. I was a little less shocked. I heard some rumors about it. And then, you know, I came home a little bit deflated. And um, now I see patients half the time, so I do, I do have a salary source, so that, that was good. But that was the only grant that I've been working on for six months. Literally the next day, I received a phone call from a colleague um, in the Department, Le Department of en 
now it's environmental and public health, who called me and said, listen, Marian, there's an opportunity to write a grant uh, for the World Trade Center survivors that we've, we've had funding done for um, pulmonary you know, diseases and GI diseases, but they're actually looking for someone to do something with cardiac um, impairment. Would you be interested? So I said, sure, <laughs> let me write the grant. And then I was lucky enough to, to attain that grant. And from that, developed more networking with the Department of Public um, Health or Environmental Science and Public Health. Dr. Landrigan was in charge at the time, uh, now, now Dr. Wright, and subsequently reached out with two subsequent grants from um, the national, uh, so it's NIH grants, um, looking at pulmonary disorders and now renal disorders and the relationship with environmental pollutants and the link to cardiovascular disease. So it really sort of spearheaded this one big, what am I going to do? This whole six month like really upset, upset me, but there are always things that are, can be um, opportunities coming down the path. I'd like to follow up um, along the same lines, although my trajectory was not as dramatic. Um, it came when I was an associate professor and there was a chance opportunity because the department was in transition and they didn't, uh, they were looking for someone, looking uh, someone to uh, head the graduate st students pool and become the graduate student advisor for the department. And I took upon myself to, to learn the ropes and to be that. But that was an opportunity you had to identify existed and, and to occupy that. And, and since then, I have always um, gone ahead looking for opportunities and developing a program and, and, and developing a mission statement and then trying to accomplish that. So I so, suppose you can make it happen, what you want to do and to accomplish. Um, I want to share a, an opposite story, but it reminds me of all the pearls you guys were sharing. Um, as a junior faculty, I was in a department where um, my chair would not promote me, even though I could try to have been promoted at several other really good academic institutions. Um, I felt like I was being mistreated and harassed in some ways by different kinds of people. Um, I um, had three young kids at home. Um, both of my parents had terminal severe illnesses and were living with me. Um, I'm the breadwinner. Um, and I, I was starting to go in that hole of looking around and everything I saw was more evidence of how screwed I was. And then at some point it got low enough and I was like, wait a minute, it's just what you said. You write your own story. And then I realized if, if I was feeling like I wasn't being cared for, I could care for myself. And somehow in that anonymity, I could start figuring out what I really wanted to do because it was, I mean, I didn't feel like there was anyone left for me to disappoint. And I knew there were wonderful people around me and I just started looking for other opportunities. I know it sounds kumbaya and crazy, but it really happened and I started finding things I really love to do and things started falling into place. And instead of kind of looking at, at things so negatively, I, I started just mining for gold and finding it in a lot of different places. And I'm really glad I did, because otherwise I was going to have to completely change careers. So it worked. Great. Um, uh, thank you all. So the next question, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, we're always told about mentorship and how important it is. Um, but we're, I'm going to ask you how important uh, and how critical mentors and advocates were to your own career advancement, and then also tips for helping folks find a mentor. So oh, um, I I'm asked to speak a lot about mentorship now, and uh, I never really had one. Quite frankly, I, I never had the kind of mentor that I now try to be to my trainees. Uh, I never had someone who. Um, took me under their wing and invested in me and my career. And, you know, if you think about, uh, if you go back to the, uh, I, I think maybe it's Greek rather than Latin roots of, of the word, but uh, the, the opposite of mentor is protege, right? And I was never somebody's protege. I never had that luxury. But what I was able to do was to find uh, different things in different people. And so I had lots of people who helped me in various ways, who gave me things that were valuable, some of them intentionally, some of them just, you know, incidentally. 
but I never really had someone who invested a time and energy in me. And so once I got to the point where I was mentoring other people, uh, it, it was what I had lacked that I really uh, tried to be. So um, now I have a lot of people whom I mentor, and it's very interesting what you ask. So if you're looking for a mentor, I, I have to tell you that it is for you to find the mentor. Nobody is going to come down, tap you on the shoulder and say, come, I'm going to take care of you. Maybe that happens for some people. I, I don't know any of those people. Uh, most of the people I have who I'm mentoring now, though, they, they chose me. They wanted to be mentored by me. They presented themselves as wanting that. And I, you know, I start by investing a little bit. I give them something to do. I get approached by students all the time, and I that sort of that's this is my routine. Any Sinai student, or really anybody affiliated with Sinai, can get 30 minutes of my time. You can get on my calendar. You can come and ask me for whatever kind of advice you want, and I'll listen to you, and then I'll give you something to do. And I'll say, go do that, and when you've done that, come back to me. Half of them never come back. That's okay. They self-select. Of the, of the half that come back, half of them did not do what I suggested in the first place. I just repeat myself, you don't progress. It's like first you have to do this. But the ones who listened, did it, come back now and say what's next, now I start to invest in really helping them launch their career because they've shown me they have the energy, the enthusiasm, and the follow through. So if you want a mentor, Show your mentor those things. Go with an ask. Don't go sort of lost. Say, I, you know, I really want you to help me figure out you know, how to do this project or how to write this grant or how to get this opportunity so that I can be helpful. And it won't always work, uh, but make yourself uh, into somebody who it is rewarding to help because you actually move forward. So that's my advice. Um, I'd like to... Uh I call all of that, Dr. Dichiran, just, Lynn, just like you, I didn't have any mentors. My PhD uh, mentor quit science, my postdoc mentor, one of them died, and the other one retired. So when I was looking wow. for a position, there was nobody to write letters of recommendation. Oh. recommendation. So I had to seek out people. So mentors doesn't have, don't have to be the, the ones that you worked with or within your institution. They can be the people outside who know you outside your institution, outside your circle, at conferences you have met or people in other institutions that you have gone and you have interacted with, right? So this is why I said grow your community. So having had that um, uh, experience, mentoring is very important to me. I invest a lot in mentoring and I actually go do seek out mentees. So I do actually find, <laughs> yes, when You're I go You're a rare to, bird, Lakshmi. <laughs> at, at, at conferences uh, where I, I, I see that someone can really flourish and, and blossom and they would need a little bit of mentoring, I do actually take them by their hand and say, can we have lunch and can I, can I talk to you about, <laughs> right? But having said that, um, um, most of the times the mentees have to choose the mentors. So uh, be, don't be shy, right? You have to be proactive. And the way I actually went about choosing my mentors is actually it's like, can I have a cup of coffee with you and tell you about my work? And I would like to hear your opinion on that. And by just developing that relation, I actually developed uh, uh, some of the, uh, the uh, uh, mentors who actually became my sponsors, right? You know about advisors, mentors, and sponsors. So. So you can actually, in fact, um, seek out mentors, and they actually will be your spokespeople, spokespersons, right? So um, back to mentoring, um, that is uh, every mentor-mentee relationship is unique, right? There is no one, uh, one question you need to ask or one script that you have to go through to develop the relationship. Just approach the person who, who you think might, can help you, and then, then develop, the, the, develop a relationship, develop the conversation, and go from there. Yeah. I just want to really briefly say, mentors need mentees. I 
partly did not have a great mentor because someone actually offered to mentor me and she was so important, I never called. So remember, if, like, what would we do if we didn't have mentees, right? So know that we need you and, and, and come forward because it's really important and don't, don't make the mistake I made. Yeah, and one thing I tell people is that just bother me. It's I won't remember. It, you just have to yeah. keep emailing, keep calling. If I forget, it's nothing personal. Just call again, and that the best the best mentees are the ones who are the most persistent. Be pleasantly persistent. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if you guys can comment a little bit about um, the experiences. Are there differences for men versus women in terms of the mentorship? What was striking about what I just heard is you, many of you, many of you just mentioned the fact that you didn't have mentors really in early stages in your career, and you're all seated at this table and have successful uh, careers here at Sinai. So just wanted your commentary about whether you think your male colleagues have had similar experiences, and just to talk a little bit about you know, women in academic medicine and, 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 and some challenges that may be unique and some may not. So, I mean, I think uh, all young faculty and young trainees struggle, but I do think that women have special challenges. Just as, uh, uh, as a woman of color, I've had special challenges. And some of that is around the multiple roles that you play, uh, talking about Carol's um, you know, all of the balls you have to keep in the air. And when I was um, developing my career and I didn't have a single mentor, I did look for sort of role models who could help me in all aspects of my life. And so you do need professional mentors, people who are content experts in your area. You may need methodologic mentors, people who can train you on things that you need to learn. Um, career mentors, which is like someone above you who sort of has the kind of career you're aspiring to. And then I had personal mentors, you know, successful women who actually were single parents, as I was. And, and having someone who understood what that was like, even if they didn't know anything about my science or my discipline, was very important. And so that's what I mean about getting different things from different people. And I think that's particularly important for uh, women. I, I do think that now I have both male and female mentees or even protégés. Um, they do seem to come in different flavors, so I agree with Lakshmi. Each, each individual dyad is unique, but I spend a lot of time with my female mentees, stroking them, building them up, helping develop their self-esteem. Most of them do not realize how good they are. And most of the men are not as good as they think they are. And I spend some time, you know, sort of smacking them around figuratively. No violence, no physical violence. But sort of reining them in. No, you're really not ready for that yet. You know, it's, it's very interesting, but I do see sort of the stereotypical uh, gender roles emerge often. It's not without exception, but very often. And that's your job as a mentor. It's whatever... Whatever that mentee needs, some need to be, you know, pushed and coaxed. Some need to be reined in and directed, and and you know that's that's the job. So I do see some differences in what the men and the women in general seem to need, but there are exceptions to every rule. Um, that was great, Lynn. But I I, I agree that. Um, so from where you are in your training, you'll change mentors mm -hmm. at some point, and that's what happened to me. I had, my boss was my original mentor, and he was you know, quite happy to be my mentor when I was doing what, you know, clinically what he wanted to do, and even writing the papers that he wanted to write. But when I started branching off into something that was a little bit different, he was less enthused. And in fact, when I received that first big grant, um, with the World Trade Center, he said, oh no, you'll, that will never work. You can never, that'll never be a success. And six months later, when I had enrolled, you know, 500 of the 2,500 patients that we enrolled, he had it on his desk. He says, I'm showing everyone what great work you did. And he told one of my colleagues, he said, go do what Marianne did. She listened to me. And I said, no, Sean, <laughs> he, he, he told me the opposite. He told me not to bother doing it. I was going to fail. So, so then <laughs> the other interesting thing, the, the mentor doesn't have to be here at the, you know, at your home base. 
uh, this is another chance opportunity that that same mentor of mine said this is literally almost 20 years ago I had just come back from my honeymoon the day after my honeymoon he sent me and uh, another cardiologist to Argentina to give six talks <laughs> and this is old slides you wouldn't believe I mean we had each of us because basically he was helping his friend in Argentina so we had to prepare six different talks uh, you know to, to pay our way so there was a chance meeting of a very prominent cardiologist from UCSF um, a woman who then really sort of to help take me under my wing and and really help me because she she had a different attitude about mentorship and then literally six months later she was supposed to go to Spain and present and she could not go so she said would you take my place and go so she gave me other great opportunities that I'm very grateful for so she lives in California I live here but I still value her you know very greatly coming back to the question that um Dr. Howell started with that do men and women get different kind of mentoring? Well, uh, when I mentor, I do have mentees that are male and female, right? But the, the, the women tend to be much more uh, quiet and not seeking of help as much as the men. So, so they, they realize that mentoring is important and they come and and, and solicit advice actively as much as women. So in, in their behavior itself, that men end up getting more mentoring, quote unquote, because they're seeking that much more. So in mentoring, what, we, what I tend to do is for women to be, you have to be self-promoting, and you have to be a little bit selfish, asking for help, which we don't want to do, right? So you have to realize the limitations that we have, and then go beyond that, and, and, and really we aggressively seek mentoring, right? Um, Liz, I think you were also asking, is it matter if your mentor is male or female? And um, in, in my experience, I've had um, some of the best and worst experiences with both. Um, so I've had female mentors do things that I tolerated that I think if it was a male mentor, I would have, I would have called foul, and I've had male mentors that pulled me aside and said, "You look really tired. Is your balance okay?" So I think that, I, I for me, it can be, it can be either one, um, and and I think there have been a lot of discussions about who your mentor needs to be. But I, I agree with all of you. It's, it's, it's having the courage and the confidence to come forward, um, be. Um, persistent um, and be vulnerable enough that you let that mentor um, help you see your strengths and face your weaknesses um, and and that's you know that'll be up to each of you whether that's going to be a, a man or a woman or if it's going to be from a similar racial and ethnic background to you or different um, but I, I think none of that matters as much as the unique connection you'll have with a mentor yeah, I mean, I think similar to what a lot of people here said, I, I don't think, I don't even think there were women mentors. I, I mean, I, there, there, there weren't, I mean, there, were, there weren't. So, but there are different things you talk to about, diff, you know, with different people. So, and, and the other thing is your mentor doesn't have to be here. Your mentor can be here. Yeah, I mean, I remember even Liz giving me advice about something that I don't know that many other people could have given me advice about. I think that you just have to basically look to different people for different things, just like everyone else has said. For those of you who don't realize, Dr. Blank and I did residency together many years ago, but we won't say how many. <laughs> um, I am just going to ask you uh, one more question about mentorship, and then I'm going to change to leadership. But even if you don't tell us the exact nature of the largest source of frustration, if you can, that would be helpful. But also the, the strategies you use to overcome that in your career. So I'm curious if anyone would like to share what the largest source of frustration was, or at least the strategies they used to sort of overcome it. Not having time. <laughs> and and strategy is prioritization. Back to, I had um, some gender bias, I would say, with salary. And I um, became very vocal about it and, you know, found out later that my boss wasn't particularly happy that I was vocal. But, but I 
it was I was really young in my career, but I found out that a, a male colleague who really we did around the same things and had spent the same time doing similar things was making probably ten thousand dollars more at the time, which was a lot. And um, I brought it to my boss's attention, and he's like, "Oh no, 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 that's not right." And then he pulled out the file on my colleague and looked and looked it up at me and said, "Oh yes, you're right." And so you know he. And I said to him, I think that I think the reason is because of gender. And I just blurted it out. And he was like, oh, but I'm not. I'm not sexist. I, you know, I have so many women fellows, I, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, he changed my salary, but I heard through the grapevine he was not very happy with me. But I think you, you know, I was just so frustrated. And then literally 10 years after that, which is now around 10 years ago, or 15, let's say around five years ago, I was in the room with him with another male colleague. And he said to me something like, oh, you have your children. You know, I know you're busy, but and you have your children at home. And he turned to the male colleague and didn't mention his children. Now, my male colleague's children were downstairs in our shared office <laughs> using my laptops. And I reminded my boss that my husband is a stay-at-home father. And so that I work 80 hours with no problem. <laughs> and I felt like <laughs> really jumping across the table. But it is so blatant, right? <laughs> yes. And, um, so that's why I have a different mentor, but you know. So, but it's true. You have to just, you know, be be firm and and resolute and and make sure that those biases are not perpetuated. Yeah, a, a big frustration I've actually had is with myself. I don't know if any of you are familiar with imposter syndrome. I mean, I think we all really have that. And I I think when you when you think about how it started. When I first started in my first job, I was the, the, I was in a group of six, and I was the one woman. And actually, it must have been five because all the four of them every Friday used to go play golf, and um, and I would cover everything. You remember that? <laughs> anyway, finally, I finally said something at one point. I said, "Do you know you leave?" Because I, because I really I really one of my mentors was one of the people that was here, and I really admired this person. I said, "Do you realize that?" every Friday you all leave and you all go play golf and I'm covering everything. And he said, but you don't play golf. And I said, but that's not really the, that's not, that was, that added to my imposter syndrome thing, but that wasn't really the point. I think, I, I and I don't know how those two things are quite related, but I just think that you have to just keep thinking true to yourself and thinking if I wanted to play golf, I'd play go golf, but I, I really don't. I just think you, I, but I, I think I could have gone the rest of my life never saying anything and just putting up with that. I just have to, just because you said the golf and it was on my mind, but there's a president's golf outing every year, at least, I don't know if it still goes on, but I had, I was invited a couple of times. And the time that I showed up, right, there was one other woman there who um, is a surgeon and she was playing. And someone, everyone on the panel knows, a, a senior male physician here, saw me show up. I was late, so I was like, gonna, whatever. But I walk in, he's like, what are you doing here? Do you live near here? Yes. Yes, that was his response. And I said, no, I was invited. And he's like, oh. And then another older surgeon at the table said, oh, did you arrange all the dinner tonight? Like, he didn't know who I was. Yeah, so, so that was a few years ago. So I should have thought, my mother always told me to play golf because her, my father was a big golfer. So was like, that's the moral of the story. Is maybe we should all learn how to play golf. But yes, so those are true, yeah, true stories. So um, I I don't know when 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 you gasped at what Marianne said if it was because you're sharing like was that a me too moment for you guys or was it I can't believe that happened to you and and I and this is not directly answering your question but I do want to say this because it's a concern for me um, which is that most of the women in my cohort. Um, during their training were verbally and or usually and physically abused, harassed, raped, these kind of things. Um, and it was terrible. And, and I, I know that's happening. While things are not hunky-dory, um, they are better now. I don't think there's as much outright, if I'm not mistaken, like physical harassment as there used to be. Not that any level of it, we should have zero tolerance. Um, but one of the things I've been hearing from people recently when I share some of the stories of things that happened to me earlier on is, and I, I'm hearing this from younger women, is why did you let that happen? 
um, what happened to you? I don't understand. I wouldn't have let that happen. Um, and didn't you go tell somebody about it? So one of the things that I, I, I want us to remember um, when, you know, Marianne tells a story or I tell a story is that we're a family in this um, and, and, and we should make sure that we're, and I'm not, I'm not blaming any of you. I'm not saying that I felt a vibe from any of you that you were blaming Marianne, but it is a fear that I have that as things get better, we're going to not recognize the struggles of others and, and that's not fair to them and it also means it could be repeated. Um, I'm going to sort of change a little bit and, 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 you know, there's been a lot of focus on us developing young leaders. And here at Sinai, we started a leadership academy for junior faculty so that we can try to help build leadership skills for that faculty. Um, I think we need to work more on senior faculty, and hopefully that will be a future um, endeavor. But I wanted, you guys are all leaders, and I wanted to ask you um, and start out by just asking you, what are the unique experiences you think, because you're women, that you've had to face or challenges as women leaders? We know the answer is that they have faced some, so they have to get. They have to start talking here. I, I th this is this is going to sound strange, but I think some people like in the old world, um, people just became leaders because they were next in line. So they just assumed they were going to become leaders. And I think a lot of women don't necessarily assume they're going to become leaders. So we take the job a lot more seriously. You run a meeting, you do things properly, you pay attention to how you speak. So I think maybe we just feel like you have to do a better job at everything. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile to, you want, if you're a leader, you want to make sure that you're doing the best job that you can. You don't just want to wing it. I, I learned that <laughs> hard way. But you want to just show up and really do a good job at what you're doing and uh, have intent in what you're doing. Um, how about, um, interesting, um, well, what have you guys learned in terms of leadership in your positions? And it doesn't have to be related to being a woman. It can be anything. But what are sort of some of the, whether it's um, the way you deal with your colleagues, the way that you run your meetings, what is it that you think has made you most successful at your job, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, thank you. I think it would be consensus building, you know, just to, with, with your group as a leader, going you know, to, to form a, um, a leadership team and build consensus and find consensus about the membership who you're leading. So consensus building has been um, challenging, but also it is, I think for me, has been the way in which that I've learned that it becomes successful to be a successful leader. I, I mean, I agree with what um, what Stephanie said about often you don't, um, you sort of have to seek out the leadership position and when you get it, that you didn't assume that it was going to be yours. So I think maybe we are more intentional about it. I mean, I think, you know, the two things that leaders really have to learn to do well are to listen and to act. And of course, we've all worked for leaders who do one and not the other. Um, I think it's uh, largely about communication and it is helping every member of your team sort of become the be their best selves. I mean, people want to do well. They want to excel. They want to have meaningful work. And if you can create an environment where they are able to do that, then, yeah, I mean, this, and people often ask me, you know, I've built a very successful department and people like, what's your, what's your secret? Well, I, I recruit very talented people and let them make me look good. I mean, and to some extent, that is like the secret to leadership because you create an environment where you all excel together. Uh, I do think you have to set clear expectations and you have to figure out, it's just like with the mentee thing, you have to figure out what each employee or subordinate needs from you and be that. So you're not kind of, you know, monolithic or dogmatic, like you do the same thing with everybody. You sort of do whatever each person needs you to do. And I love, I have to say, I love it when I have people who um, work for me 
who manage me well. I love that. So learn to manage up. So they make it easy for me to do what they need me to do. This is, and these are the people I see, they, they will go so far. They don't just do what they're supposed to do, they help me do what I'm supposed to do. And I think uh, good leaders will welcome that and embrace that, you know, as, as Carol said. Like, we, we need those people sort of helping us to do the things that, that we do. So I, I sometimes clearly I think being a woman or being black has been a problem for some of the people in the group. I mean, the thing that happens uh, after you've been here for a while is you kind of get to select your own team. And I think that's, that's really when it all becomes fun. You know, early on, some of the early leadership positions I had, I sort of was given a title and everybody was in place and you kind of had to work with what was there. And there were a lot of challenges. People who felt like they should have had the job, like you weren't qualified, like they didn't have to put up with you, all of this kind of uh, thing. And I think you just work through it by being intent on your goal, showing people that you can get it done. Uh, sometimes you have to teach an object lesson. Sometimes you have to clear out some dead wood. I think you have to not be afraid to do those things when required. Sometimes you have to take a chance. You know, as the saying goes, you can't cross a chasm in two big steps. Like sometimes you have to take that leap. And, uh, and if you fall, then you, you know, you dust yourself off and you get back up and you go again. So, you know, it, it, be not afraid, you know, you've already all accomplished so much in your lives. If you would just own it, you would realize you can do anything that you put your mind to. I agree with what everyone said. I think it's important to figure out what your voice is going to be. It took me a while to both um, recognize and understand the culture that I wanted as part of my own team, which a lot of it is doing my absolute best to only bring people in that are smarter than me. Um, is to is to be is to is to try to lead as much as I can by standing up, standing back, and hoping people will manage me, like you were saying. Um, so creating the culture that I want in my own team, but also finding my own voice, so that when there was injustice and things that I knew were wrong, how was I going to say that? Um, how was I going to was was it going to be an angry voice? Was it going to be an optimistic voice? Was it going to be a fist in a silk glove? You know, like you, how are you going to stand up for things that you see that are wrong toward you and toward other people? And how do you do it without fear of, um, you know, if I see an injustice like what Marion did, that's really brave. Like to be able to say to your boss and your mentor, that's wrong because you know you're taking a risk. But you need to take those risks because if you don't, it's just going to keep raining on you and you're going to internalize it. So I think creating your own culture and finding your voice to, to, to make the change that you need to see are really important. Great. So I'm going to open it up to the audience. Are there any folks who would like to ask a question? Hi. So it's not so much so much a question but kind of a statement. So I was once told by a woman that um, I shouldn't hire – um, any women that have young children because um, a child care that may miss work and all that stuff. And the reason I share that with you is because I think it's important for women, anyone, but women in particular, to feel comfortable about supporting and advocating for other women. So I just think that's something to talk about um, because I do think in, in certain cir circumstances there may some, be some discomfort especially if you get in a leadership role. You're expected to advocate for other folks, but then there's this, 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 this comfort um, around either your own security or other issues that will prevent you from doing that. So I just think it's something maybe to discuss. Yeah, well, thank you for that um, comment, Dr. Miller. Um, I, what can I say? Sometimes um, people get co-opted by, you know, their oppressors, so. Um, I, you know, certainly being in a leadership role, and, and I have to tell you, I have um, three of my 23 staff members currently out on maternity leave. And, you know, when the first one came in, it was like quite a surprise. She was not trying, not married, okay. And then three weeks later, the next one comes in, and then a month later, and I'm like, okay. And so this is the kind, I mean, there are practical reasons why people think these things. But the first thing is that 
Um, I firmly believe that intelligent, educated, you know, uh, active women should have children, should reproduce. And if you believe that as a societal value, then you're going to have to figure out how to make it work in the workplace, right? So uh, we all just have to get over this idea. And the other thing is, you know, I have a male employee who just told me he's going out for three weeks because he's having some surgery. So there's no guarantee that you won't have absenteeism and problems if you avoid hiring women with young children. And I'll tell you, I have mentored several junior faculty through multiple pregnancies that they built their career, and those women are organized, motivated. Some of them were so productive during that maternity leave, they finished all those papers. That had, so they did not miss a beat, and they did not fall behind. And they figured out how to make it all work. And I think that's uh, what women do. So, But you're right. It disturbs me when I hear women sort of buying into that, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't hire women with uh, young children because, you know, it's inconvenient. There are lots of things in life that are inconvenient. Yeah. I ignore the advice. We knew you would. <laughs> Never doubted but that you had. Um, thank you for your panel. I have a question about the fact that we are where we are today with, with women doctors not really having a uniform, as far as I know, policy on paid maternity leave. So as the largest employer in New York City, I don't think that physicians have protection on getting pregnant, having kids, and balancing that fact. Do you think we'll get there soon? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it depends on how long you've been here, but for faculty, actually, it's not so bad, but maybe that varies by department. I, I don't really, I don't really, now, I, your question catches me by surprise because everybody in my department, in fact, does get paid maternity leave. So I'm a little, I'm a little confused as to what you're talking about. All I can say is I just started this a few weeks ago. It's not on the website yet. <laughs> um, we don't have the data on across the institution yet, but we will. Um, and and this is one of the things that Dean Charney gave a lot of confidence that we would be looking into and seeing it. I think it's not only a challenge, you know, this becomes a challenge not only for women having children, but also for men having children, and a particular challenge for people adopting children, um, where there's far less protection. So I think this is, this, isn't, this is one of the areas that we're going to be starting to look really carefully in. And if you would like to be part of that, Please send me a note. You know how it is when you have a good comment. Welcome in. Sorry, the ACGME does have very short amount of times that they'll let you go out on maternity leave, and but but that you just need to give back that time at the end, I believe. But that's not male, female. Yeah, that's just training. What is your name? Laura Sakaisik. Thank you. Um, Thanks for sharing your experiences um, with us. Um, I think my question probably, um, I guess, is aligned a bit with um, Dr. Miller's question. Um, I, you know, I was thinking a lot about to um, the last speaker for I think is it Lynn Ro Roberts? Okay, um, and which she was bringing. Uh, talking about Kimberly Crenshaw's work in this kind of intersectional um, or intersectionality and like if you've read her work like Kimberly Crenshaw talks about kind of like imagine the ceiling being kind of the the trying to being in a basement and trying to move up and this idea that um, those policies that kind of help people are going to help those who are most privileged among us. And so certain people are gonna be able to move up past the ceiling while others are gonna struggle to, to get there. I'm probably not saying it well, but um, I was wondering if you could talk, and I don't know, maybe this is Lakshmi, um, Liz, um, Lynn, um, sorry, uh, Dr. Howell, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Debbie, Dr. Richardson. Um, um, but but I, I wanted to um, ask a little bit about something that I've been noticing here at Sinai, especially um, 
among women of color faculty who are primarily in research um, positions where um, feeling kind of less supported um, at times, even compared to some of the male faculty of color. And so there almost feels like there has to be like this collective push to try to figure out how we can all, like b we have to stop, we, we end up stop we stop thinking about just kind of our individual trajectory and being forced to kind of think about this collective trajectory, which can be a little tiring. So it means that if I know that this particular female faculty of color, if she doesn't get this next grant, she's out of her department, for example. That means that even if I have 10 grants that I'm already working on as the biostats co-i, it means that I'm going to have to try to figure out how to find time in like the midnight hour just to help her because you, you feel like there's, there's a bit of a struggle. And I was just wondering if you can talk a bit more about what particular policies are in place here at Sinai to really try to get at some of the most vulnerable subgroups because we talk about women, we talk about uh, sometimes in the ODI or CMCA, we talk about faculty of color, we talk about different things, but there are particular subgroups, especially those on the investigator track of color, which is like five people, you know, like, well, maybe 10, uh, two of which represented at the table. Um, I, th I think it's a real struggle and I think it's a conversation that isn't had. And so I was wondering what you could tell us about either how you have tried to think about how to address this, also for those um, who are mentoring, how you have tried to address this, particular concerns among women of color. Yeah, this is something that Dr. Howell and I have been talking about, to actually have, start having a focus group, how to address um, the, um, the issues of women of color in research, uh, research and investigator track and research positions. So it is something that probably we'll be working uh, with Dr. Horowitz and actually tomorrow we have a meeting to talk about that. How about that? <laughs> so so it's, you know, we, uh, we realize that, that the mentoring program that we have doesn't, uh, um, uh, is not broad enough that we just ask each of the mentees to identify two mentors um, you're all supposed to have two mentors, by the way. Uh, uh, right, exactly, exactly. So it's something that we will have to go back and revisit and then make sure that to meet with the mentoring uh, leaders and champions to, to make sure of that. But that is uh, slightly different from what you're asking is to actually have, um, to address the, 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 the needs of um, the subgroups that have additional support that is needed. So um, such as um, uh, the investigator track uh, faculty, women faculty, and women of color faculty. Yeah, they, they fall, yeah, 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 exactly. Out. So, we so may, we, we, we need may to start on investigator track, and we we fall out. Right, right, know? right. So we need to have a larger uh, mentoring cohort for you guys. So we have to we have to come up with with ideas and, and, and address that, and so that is kind of on the, on the plate already. I mean, I think some of it, unfortunately, goes uh, back to the earlier question. Since I, I never actually had a mentor, I was never anybody's protege, so I've never had anybody who could protect me when I get to a vulnerable place or a break in the funding. And so I've always uh, felt or maybe known that I was on my own and I had to figure out for myself how to make it work. I. I do think that that is, uh, you know, that's a burden we shouldn't have to have. I mean, uh, my uh, sort of my whole um, life, I've overcome prejudice and discrimination through excellence and being outstanding, which is not really a burden that everybody should have to bear. And I've been able to make that work for the most part, but why should I have to be extra good, extra smart work, extra hard? when there are those around me who, uh, for whom more is done. And so I think you're right. Again, now that I have mentees of various kinds and shades, I, I do keep an eye on them. I do try to be fair-minded. I, 
I do see um, uh, some of them as being so valuable that I will extend myself a little bit further. And also, often, I'm sort of the only protection they have that they don't have other sources to go to. But I think you're right. It's something we should have a conversation about, you know, if, if the institution, you know, truly values, you know, sort of um, a diversity and the success of all, you know, we have to figure out all the ways that it takes to make up for the lack of privilege that some of us come from. And um, sometimes we don't always do a good job of that. You're right. So. Add one thing, and then we'll have um, we'll go back to Dr. Miller, who wanted to add. And I think that you bring up a really important issue, and something I think about, I think about every day. Um, you know, as an OBGYN health services researcher, there, it was really hard for me too because there was no one doing health services in OBGYN. There were no, I mean, that was a foreign thing already. And so finding a mentor and 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 the path, and that's a much longer conversation, which I'm happy to share at a different time has been difficult, but I think it's particularly important when we hear every day about how it's harder for us to get an NIH-funded grant, that we're, we're, we're far less represented in, in, in R01s, um, and, and that we can, as an institution, say that we value diversity on one hand, but then say at the bottom line it's only about your NIH funding mechanism when we know that mechanism is somehow flawed, right, from the very beginning. And so I think this requires conversation, it requires input from you and others, and that we need as a, as a group of folks who are trying to address this to really start to hear from junior faculty and everyone about the ways we might be able to address it. I mean, you know, ideally, I always say, if we had just a pool of money, we could kind of help people out a little bit, but that has not been something that's been easy to, 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 to get. And maybe with Dr. Um, Horowitz uh, now in her new role will be able to figure that out a little bit better. But we've been thinking about this because there's no question that um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for everyone in this current NIH environment, but it's a particularly acute for uh, uh, folks of color. And I think sometimes in these conversations when we talk about faculty of color and then we talk about women, we're not talking about women of color. And I think that voice gets lost a lot, and I think we have to be conscious and we have to be outspoken about it and make sure that we're trying to address it. Because I, I, I definitely have, over my years here, have definitely felt that. Did you want to? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to go back to the uh, question about maternal leave, uh, pay for maternal leave. It kind of parallels a conversation that's been going on here for years around um, child care. My own experience is when I was at Columbia, Columbia had a very well established system for, day, for daycare. And my career benefited from that. And I think that maybe um, one thing that needs to happen to move this conversation, both of these conversations along, and it may be already be happening, but if it's not, you've got to get the males, your male counterparts at Mount Sinai to be partners in this conversation. And unfortunately, that's what it's going to take, because they're benefiting, they would benefit from it as well. But I haven't really heard that as an approach to, to moving this thing forward yet. So I, I, I wholly agree with you that having men as, as uh, co-champions is important. Women are not perfect. Men are not perfect. We're going to find champions where we find champions. And I think it will be important for men to be part of it. Um, I, I do want to have a door open about a concern I'm hearing from some of my mentees more now in the Me Too age, which is um, especially for women of color that the black female tax is getting higher. So this idea that now people are feeling and they're getting pressure to say, I don't see any women in your group. I don't see any black women in your group. Um, that that this small number of women are getting tapped and tapped and tapped to be on all these different committees and all these different things. And that can end up derailing your career by serving all these things to show the things representative that don't end up helping you. So I think one of the things that we're really going to need to figure out as our institution gets more sensitive um, to, you know, like um, Eric Nestler calls it, affirmative attention. You know, really looking at everything you're doing and saying what's missing, why is it missing, and doing something about it. You know, I think we all need to keep an eye on that things are getting better and it's not, it's not, uh, I'm not, I'm not trying to say in a negative way window dressing, but we want to make sure that the things that we're doing for representation are really helping the person that's doing the representing. So um, we have time for like one more question because we're now at the two o'clock hour. Does anyone have one more closing thought? No. 
So um, I just want to say thank you to our very esteemed panelists here who have been long time contributors. I know some have only come recently to Sinai, uh, Dr. Blank, uh, who's been here for two years, but everyone else here has been here for quite some time and have uh, you know, been part of the fabric of this institution and, and part of the reason that we have done so well in, in our research portfolio and why we're number 12 is a lot of the women here who are on this table. Uh, and they're also serving as tremendous role models for all of our faculty, whether they're men or women. Um, so please join me in um, thanking them. And thank you.